Today we're looking at an example essay. Uh, this is an example of an exposition essay. It's a news report from, I think, March. Um, and it, it is taken from The Economist. Do you guys know The Economist? Does anyone read The Economist? OK, so if you go to a bookstore and you buy The Economist, it looks like a magazine, but it's actually a newspaper, and they also call themselves a newspaper. It's a newspaper that looks like a magazine that comes out once every week. Um, but it's a newspaper because um, instead of publishing like a special story every issue, every issue is just the news, politics, economy, uh, social news, uh, cultural news, and it's very thick. Like I used to read one every week, but it took too much time because there's so much news around the world every week. Um, so instead, now I read the online version. Uh, and this story is from one of the issues in March. The Economist is a British newspaper, so they use British English. I will point out some of the places where you should not copy their grammar and spelling. Uh, another thing about The Economist is that it, the reports are anonymous. So they treat the entire newspaper uh, as written by one person, which is not true, uh, but they don't tell you the author of each report. Uh, this is not what The Economist looks like. I tried to print the PDF from their website, and for some reason, between the pages, some lines went missing. Uh, so instead, I saved it to an app called Pocket, which can save articles that you want to read, and I printed it from there. Uh, so as you can tell from the title, it's about Ukraine's war economy. Scroll down the Instagram profile of Kacharovska, a clothing company in Ukraine, and one can spot the precise moment that Russia invaded. Now, we say that the first sentence should attract the reader, should want to make the reader uh, keep reading. Do you think this sentence does a good job? When you read this first sentence, do you want to keep reading? Well, it might be interesting because it talks about a clothing company on Instagram, but immediately it connects it to the war, the precise moment that Russia invaded. Um, people like to look at a uh, spectacle, and uh, if you look at a company's Instagram and suddenly everything changes, that can be a kind of spectacle. Um, so when readers read this first sentence, they might want to think, uh, they might want to see, okay, how? How can I tell the precise moment? Stylish photography of long legs and high heels gives way to walls of text calling for action and donations and unglamorous images of shoemakers in baggy clothing. OK, so it's a clothing company. Their Instagram is usually full of beautiful models wearing beautiful clothes. But at one point, these pictures give way to, which means are replaced by, walls of text, so long paragraphs of words uh, calling for action and donations and there are still pictures, but the pictures are unglamorous, so not stylish, not fashionable. And they are pictures of shoemakers in baggy clothing. Baggy clothing means the clothing is big and loose and unfashionable. So when you read the second sentence, that answers your question. Yes, uh, Russia invades at this point, but it uh, leads readers to wonder about new questions. Why are, are we looking at shoemakers? It's a clothing company. They don't only sell shoes. So why are we looking at shoemakers? 
And the third sentence answers that question. The firm or the company has teamed up with other outlets to produce 1000 pairs of shoe of boots for soldiers every week. Uh, so it's because they are now focusing on soldiers boots. Uh, and this is also a very interesting sentence. Usually we expect companies to compete against each other. But here it says that these companies are now working together to make boots for soldiers. So you'll notice in this first paragraph, it's three sentences, but there are no connections, no and, no but, no however, no moreover, no for example. And yet when we read this paragraph, everything fits together. And that is because each sentence prepares the reader for the next sentence. Each sentence sets up a question that the next sentence answers. The first sentence says there's a precise moment. You can tell Russia has started the war, and so we want to know what is that moment. The second sentence mentions that you suddenly see pictures of shoemakers, and so we want to know why shoemakers. And the third sentence explains that, but it then says these companies are working together. That's also a question. How did these competing companies end up working together? And so every sentence, there's something to draw the reader, to keep the reader reading. There are always questions that have not yet been answered. For army boots, you need very thick leather, explains Alina Ocherenti. Uh, Ocheretiana, the owner. The stuff she uses for women's boots is not up to scratch. Um, up to scratch means it's not good enough. In this case, it's not thick enough. So other companies make the parts of the shoe. Her workers sew them together. So to answer the previous sentence's question, why do these companies work together? Because each individual company cannot make the soldiers boots. They have to work together in order to make them. Uh, and how do they work together? Other companies make the parts and this company puts the parts together. The gear will be shipped across the country to branches of Ukraine's Territorial Defense Force, which are sending their orders via private message on Instagram. So yes, the boots will go to soldiers, but the interesting part of this sentence is that the soldiers are sending their orders on Instagram. So why did the article start with Instagram? Why are these companies advertising on Instagram? Uh, about their support of soldiers, because that's how soldiers contact them and ask them for supplies like boots. Uh, now, in this case, it's Ukraine's territorial defense force. This is not a regular army. It's kind of between the army and the police. Uh, the territorial defense force territory is the area of land controlled by a country. So this kind of army is in charge of defending Ukrainian land. They're not the guys who are fighting on the front lines. They're the guys throughout Ukraine that make sure there are no Russian spies, that uh, make sure there are enough supplies for the community. Um, so it's not exactly the front line. But they're also soldiers and they need boots. Thanks to a crowdfunding campaign, Katerovska can continue to pay its workers while providing the boots free of charge. So not only are they making boots for soldiers, they're not even selling the boots. They're giving the boots to the soldiers for free. But it's a company. So how does the company continue to pay its workers? Thanks to a crowdfunding campaign. 
So they posted something online and asked people to donate money. In Chinese, we call this Chinzo Muzi. This kind of improvisation is visible throughout Ukraine as the country struggles to keep functioning despite an all consuming war. So the, the above arrangement, is, the author calls it improvisation, which means there's no central plan. People want to do things, they try to do things together, and if it works, it works. If it doesn't work, they try something else. It's not planned. Um, and the reason everybody is like doing business in this way is because of this all consuming war. To consume here does not mean to buy or to eat. Consume here means to use up, to take up, to use up. Um, so the idea is that this war is using up everything. Everybody, uh, everybody's time, money, supplies, energy are all going to support the war. And so people, if they want to continue doing business, they have to find another way to do business. It's war economy. It's is, of course, Ukraine. It's war economy has so far been characterized by chaotic grassroots initiatives rather than centralized government planning. So in American English, characterized is spelled with a Z. Uh, and the meaning of this sentence is that the entire war economy so far is full of this kind of arrangement. Chaotic grassroots initiatives. Grassroots means from the bottom, from the people. Initiative is a plan rather than centralized government planning. Again, centralized in American English is spelled with a Z. So centralized government planning would be top down, but in this case, most of the business and ideas are coming from the bottom up. But the Ukrainian authorities are preparing to reshape society, including what workers produce. So we have a but, right? Something before this is going in the opposite direction from something after this. So it looks like most of the economy is chaotic grassroots initiatives. But the government does have a plan. And their plan will change all of society, will reshape society. Wartime economics involves precise planning of what is needed, said Denis Shmihal, Ukraine's prime minister, on March 6th. So notice this sentence, right? It says, uh, in war, the economy needs precise planning. So up to now, we've been talking about improvisation, grassroots chaos, but uh, the prime minister thinks they need precise planning. And why? Because in war, there is a great need. Uh, in normal capitalist society, companies make things, other companies sell things, and people buy those things. So how much stuff a company makes depends on how much stuff people are willing to buy. A lot of the time, these two numbers don't match, so there will be a lot of waste and things are thrown away. But in war, there is a great need. Everybody is short of everything. You can't waste stuff. And so according to the prime minister, you have to plan very carefully. And in order to plan very carefully, you need to reshape society. By the way, Ukraine has a prime minister. Huh. We know that Ukraine has a president, right? Uh, so apparently they use the uh, two heads of government kind of political system. 
like Taiwan, right? We have a president and we also have a premier, Xin Zhenzhen. So we have two people in charge of running the government. The same idea, they have a president and they have a prime minister. So there's lots of need in war, and that leads to the next paragraph. Three needs stand out. Of the many different things that are needed, three big things are very important. So from this part, we can expect that the next big part of the essay will be about three different needs. The first is to get past the initial shock of war wherever possible. The shock of war. One day you wake up, your country is at war fighting. Missiles are flying everywhere. People are dying and running. It's a huge shock. When you wake up to that kind of situation, should you go to work? Should you go to school? Most people uh, are very confused and are not sure. And many people will decide not to go. So if you want to keep the country's economy going, you have to get past that first moment of shock. Uh, this is basically what this paragraph is saying. The country's GDP has fallen by half in the first days since Russia invaded, reckons the central bank. So their GDP is now at 50% after Russia invaded. Can you imagine a GDP? Just a GDP It's really scary. The word reckon means believe. So the central bank believes this. That's what they think. Many people have abandoned regular duties to flee, fight, or take care of relatives. So people, instead of going to work, people are running away, they're going to fight, or they're going home to take care of their family. So people are not working. And that's, of course, a problem for the economy. So the government wants citizens to return to economic activity for the war effort. In English, this phrase, the war effort, means something to support your side of the war. So the government is calling on people to go back to work, not for themselves, not to make money, but to help Ukraine win the war. And so notice that this sentence uses the word citizen. It doesn't say wants people to go to work. It says citizens. So it's connected with the idea of a war effort. Uh, the idea of citizens, the war effort, it's appealing to patriotism, love of country. If you love your country, if you're a good citizen, you will go back to work to help support the war. If you were forced to evacuate, find a job in the new place, wrote Alexei Reznikov, the defense minister. So this is not the economy minister. It is the defense minister, Guo Fang Buzang, is calling on people to go to work. So that's the first thing, get people back to work. The second need is to cater to places where fighting rages. So first of all, the word rage. Here, the word rage does not mean anger, does not mean angry. You can think of this as like a fire burning. It's keep on, it's still going. The fighting is like a fire, it's still going, still burning. So the second thing is to cater to places. To cater to means to treat specially, to deal with specially. Um, originally, cater means um, like if someone is holding a, a party or some kind of event and you need food, you would call a company to make food and deliver it for your party. That is catering. So uh, this company would cater to 
your party. And so then we have the extended meaning of special treatment. So you have to treat places where they're still fighting in a special way. One official at a big Ukrainian bank describes how management wakes up each morning and decides which branches are safe to operate that day. Usually a quarter fail to open. Uh, so for this bank, every morning the management wakes up and has to decide, OK, is this part, is this bank safe enough to open? Is that bank safe enough to open? And every day around one fourth of the bank branches are not safe enough to, to do business. Right, a uh, bank branch, Fen Hang. When missiles are flying, companies and workers stay inside. I love this sentence. This is a great sentence. This sentence captures the spirit of the whole essay. When missiles are flying overhead, um, when we talk about a war, we usually focus on the fighting or the politics, or like what the president is saying. But this piece is not about that, right? This piece is about ordinary people, ordinary business people trying to get by in their daily life. So when the missiles are flying, we're not looking at the missiles. We're looking at the people who stay inside. That's what this essay is doing. For firms moving fuel, the risk is even graver. Grave here means serious. So if your firm or company is a company that moves fuel like gas or oil, then the risk is of course even more serious. It's even more dangerous. In American English, we like to add a comma here. Uh, because the main sentence begins here. And so the comma tells you that uh, everything before this is not part of the main sentence. When you do not know where the next clash between armies will begin and you are towing a huge gas tank, it is like driving a bomb, says a CEO in the industry. You'll notice that throughout this piece, everybody is either a leader or a CEO or some kind of big official. We don't really have interviews with uh, low level workers, ordinary people. And this is kind of strange because this piece is about ordinary people. Uh, and I think there are probably two main reasons why uh, this is the case. The first is probably because it's in the middle of a war. Everybody is busy, and so the journalist may have had some trouble finding ordinary people willing to spend time to talk to a British person uh, in, in the middle of their busy lives. The second possible reason, um, when a journalist writes a news report, they then submit the report to their editor and their editor will give them notes about how to revise and improve this report. Apparently, uh, this editor thought that it was OK that uh, the journalist did not interview ordinary people. And so apparently what this means is that the editor believes the entire country agrees on what they have to do to help support uh, Ukraine in the war. So if the journalist went and asked an ordinary person, their ideas would be very similar to the ideas of these CEOs and leaders. So you don't have to go and find somebody. The ideas are the same. The perspective is very similar. Um, and you know, um, ordinary workers are busy with their jobs, but part of a CEO's job is to give interviews. 
when you're a leader in a company or an organization, you are not just in charge of running the company. You're also in charge of promoting your company to let other people know what you guys are doing. Uh, so like when the journalist tries to contact leaders and CEOs, uh, these leaders are more willing to spend time talking to this journalist because that's part of their job as leaders. Uh, so we've been talking about how to deal with places that are fighting. Worst of all is the chaos in towns encircled or occupied by Russian troops, such as Marupol. Uh, remember, this is in March. Uh, as you can tell, the word encircled means surrounded by. Internet, water, and electricity are mostly gone. Food cannot arrive. And humanitarian corridors to allow civilians to escape have reportedly been mined and fired on. So uh, if you've been watching the news, you will at that time you may have heard about this thing, humanitarian corridors. Uh, these are ways to let ordinary people. Uh, civilians are people who are not soldiers. So these are ways to let ordinary people escape. Uh, in Chinese, we call this Zolang, corridor is a hallway, Zolang. But these places apparently, according to reports, have been mined and fired on. To be fired on means somebody is shooting at you. Mines are bombs underground. Delay uh, in Chinese. Uh, so there's supposed to be ways to allow people to escape, but apparently that's not true. And that's why you see this term put in quotation marks. Uh, the quotation marks tell you that this is somebody else's words. This is what other people are calling this. In other words, it's not what the author thinks. It's what other people are saying. If the author agrees, then the author doesn't have to uh, create a distance between themselves and other people. Usually this means that the author doesn't agree with these words. And the reason in this case is very obvious because they are not actually safe. They are not actually humanitarian. But notice that the author includes this word reportedly according to reports. In other words, Russia says, no, it's safe, go ahead. Uh, so the journalist can't rely on official government statements. They can only reply, uh, rely on what people are uh, on the ground are saying, uh, different reports from different people. Uh, in Chinese, we call this Wai Jie Zai Chuan. And so adding this word, tells us that this is not what the official government is saying. Uh, OK, one more point uh, on in this sentence. Internet, water and electricity, A, B and C. In British English, there is usually no comma here. But in American English, you usually should put a comma here. Um, in fact, it makes more sense to to put a comma here uh, because sometimes you will have groups of things, A and B, C, and D and E. If you don't have that last comma, how do you know how to group the last few things? You have a similar situation here. I don't know if you have noticed or not. A, where, where's my? OK. OK. Internet, water, and electricity are mostly gone. 
This is A. Food cannot arrive. This is B. And humanitarian corridors, blah, 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 have been mined and fired on. This is C. A, B, and C. Again, there's no comma here. So you're not quite sure why this sentence and this sentence can be put together using and, but there is a comma here. The grammar is not very clear. It would be much more clear if you add a comma here. Um, but the rules around this kind of comma are very flexible. Uh, I say most Americans use it. Most British people don't, but there are exceptions. Some Americans don't. Some British people do use it. But I do hope that it, when you write a list, you add a comma before the last thing. It makes it much easier to understand. Workers from Naftogaz, the state oil and gas firm, risk their lives trying to fix infrastructure damaged by battles, says Yuri Vitrenko, the company's CEO. The forced shutdown of 16 gas distribution stations as of March 6th left residents in many towns without gas, including around 100,000 people in Kiev, the capital. So as of means up to that point. So what happened after that point? Uh, the author is not sure. Uh, of course, you would only need to say this if this point is earlier than when the author is writing. So let, maybe the author is writing on March 8th but they don't have information about March 7th and March 8th, so they can only say as of March 6th. That's what this means. Um, and you also notice like when you have a name, that when you see a name for the first time, name, comma, explanation. Who is this person? Same for places. Name, comma, explanation. Uh, so Kiev is the capital, so do. Uh, and then one more thing to say, 100,000 people. Um, I know some of you may have a little bit of trouble translating numbers from English to Chinese or Chinese to English. Um, my advice is to remember the Chinese terms for thousand, million, billion, and trillion. So thousand is chen, million is bai wan, billion is shi yi, and trillion is zao. If you memorize that, um, in English, the names of the numbers follow the comma. Every time you add a new comma, it's a new word, right? So this is 100,000, but if you add another comma, it becomes 1 million. Every new comma is a new word. So that way you can move easily from the number to the English. And if you memorize the English to Chinese, you can then move easily from the English to the Chinese and back, right? So just remember those key numbers. Uh, and when you see a new number, you can start from there and adjust up or adjust down. So we've been talking about two needs. Get people back to work and uh, be careful about places that are still fighting. The final need is to assist the exodus of millions of Ukrainian refugees, typically moving in the opposite direction to the supplies for the front line. Uh, so you have millions of people going the other way. Up to this point, we've been talking about people and supplies going to support the war, but you also have millions of people running away from the war, and that creates another thing you have to take care of. Um, so here, 
the word exodus means a large group of people are leaving a place. This word comes from the Bible. In the Old Testament, the second book of the Old Testament is called the book of Exodus. Uh, and that is when the Israelites leave Egypt. In Chinese, we call this Chu Ai Ji Ji. That's where this word comes from. Um, and you have another word, front line. This is where the fighting is happening, the front line. Already more than 2.5 million people, equal to 6% of Ukraine's population, have crossed the borders into neighboring countries. Can you imagine that? 6% of people have left. Every 19 people, one person has left. Uh, and it, we know that neighbor means the people next door. So neighboring countries are the countries next door. Uh, and of course, in American English, neighbor is spelled B-O-R, no U. There's huge demand for food and fuel along the routes to safety. So not just where people go, but on the road to those places, people need food and they need gas. Uh, so the problem is not just in two places, it's along the entire road. Notice that the word demand here is uncountable. It says there is huge demand. It doesn't say there is a huge demand. This is because this word is being used in its abstract economic sense. Supply and demand, 供给需求, right? It's abstract, so it's uncountable. Long lines and empty shelves are a familiar picture even in unscathed cities such as Lviv in western Ukraine. Unscathed means unharmed, undestroyed. The cities are still there. Um, and as the article says, Lviv is in western Ukraine. It's the biggest city in the west. It's where most Ukrainians are running to or running through as they go uh, further west. So long lines and empty store shelves. Uh, uh, Volunteers offering ready-made soup and sandwiches brought from across the border help alleviate the shortages. Alleviate means to make less serious. Adding to Ukrainian companies' difficulties. So we've talked about the three big needs, but there's stuff that makes it even harder to take care of those needs. Adding to Ukrainian companies' difficulties in preserving their services is the need to divert resources to the war effort. To divert means to change the direction. To divert a river means to change the direction of the river. In this case, resources that would be used in business or daily life have to be uh, redirected to support the war. And that makes business harder. Banks have handed over most of the armored vehicles they normally use to move cash to the army. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Banks have handed over most of the armored vehicles they normally use to move cash to the army. Uh, so have you guys ever seen people like refilling an ATM, like adding money to an ATM? Usually, on the road, there's a parked car and it's 
uh, usually armored, which means it's protected against bullets, guns, weapons, uh, to make sure the money is safe. But in this case, the army needs these cars. So banks had to give them to the to the army. And so now they can't use these cars to help move uh, money around. Um, the army uses them to supply forward positions and to evacuate casualties. Forward positions. We talked about the front line. That's where the fighting is. So a forward position is near the fighting. And casualties are people who are hurt or killed by the fighting. Uh, let's see, armored vehicle. Armor is protection, uh, extra protection. Uh, in Chinese, we call this zhuang jia ce. Uh, and of course, in American English, it's spelled O-R, not O-U-R. A huge share of the fuel supply is used for military purposes. So normal people don't have enough gas because it's all going to the army. Lorry drivers. OK, lorry is British English. In American English, this is truck. Truck drivers are scarce since many of them have stopped working and taken up arms instead. Arms are weapons, so to take up arms means to go fight. Food producers are scrambling to get their wares to hungry soldiers. Uh, here scrambling uh, means struggling, trying any way they can. Uh, in Chinese, we call this so mang jiao luan. Uh, wares means products, things that they want to sell. The most common related words in English today are hardware and software. Right? These are the computer products that uh, people can buy. Hardware is physical products. Software is virtual products. Um, so let's look at the structure of this paragraph. It's very interesting. Uh, the first sentence is the topic sentence. It gives you the main idea. Stuff needs to go to the war, and that makes life harder for everybody else. The next sentence is an example. It doesn't tell you it's an example because you expect that it will be an example. It makes life harder for many people, the next thing it mentions is banks. So banks are one of the kinds of things that are harder to do because of the war. And it explains why, right? Their armored vehicles are given to the army. The next one is fuel, is also another example. The third example, truck drivers. And then if you put these three examples together, no armored vehicles, no fuel, no drivers, that gives you the fourth example. Food producers have a hard time moving their food uh, to give them to soldiers. So the key point here is it's harder and harder to move things around. Nonetheless, many supermarkets and shops continue to be restocked overnight. So they still manage to be able to have things to sell. To restock means to put up new products to sell. Nova Posta, a private postal service, has used its logistics network to ship tons of humanitarian mail across the country. So it's a postal service, like a post office, but it's a private postal service. It's, it's not a government uh, postal service. It's a, it's a company that sends mail. Uh, and so it has a logistics network. Logistics is the, the business of moving things around. In Chinese, we call this 物流. 
Ship means send, to send things, to ship things. Tons in American English, we just spell this T-O-N. It's less complicated. Of humanitarian mail. Of course, it's not mail, right? It's supplies, food, fuel. Uh, but because it's a postal service, so it gives it the name humanitarian mail, 人道信件. Banks are still operating remarkably smoothly thanks to nearly a decade of reform. So the banks were more prepared. Pensions and salaries are still being paid. Uh, pensions are the money that a company pays you after you retire. Uh, so in Chinese, it would be Tui Shou Jing. Shops are encouraged to take payments with cards rather than cash, since cash needs to be moved around. This is interesting. So shops are now encouraging people to use credit cards because if you pay with money, the shop then has to find a way to move that money to other shops, move it back to the main company. And it's hard to move things around right now. So instead, they encourage you to use credit cards. This is interesting because it actually costs companies more to use credit cards. Did you know this? How does a credit card company make money? First, from the people who can't pay the bill, but every time Secondly, every time you use a credit card, the store has to pay the card company a little money. So this is actually more expensive for these companies, but apparently it's not as expensive as finding a way to move money back. Like physical money. Ukraine's big banks quickly implemented a new scheme to allow customers paying with cards at stores to withdraw up to 6,000 rivnia, or 200 US dollars, in cash at the same time, in the hope of reducing the amount of cash that retailers will need to ship to their vaults. Right? So physical money needs to be sent to vaults, jingku. Uh, so shops encourage using cards, the big banks also have begun, implemented, means started uh, to use a new plan. Scheme means plan. In British English, scheme means plan. In American English, scheme means evil plan. Like a bad, like a, a corrupt evil plan to do bad things. Uh, but in British English, it's just a plan. So what is this plan? that customers who pay with cards can withdraw money in cash. Um, we don't have this in Taiwan, I think, but if you go to the US and you use a credit card to buy something, the store clerk will ask you, do you want cash back? Which means you can choose to withdraw some money in cash now and pay it back with your next credit card bill. And so for people who need money now, they can get some money immediately and pay it back later. So if this, according to this plan, like if you use cash to buy something, the store then has cash and they need to move this cash to a vault. But if you can encourage customers to withdraw money, then you can give them that cash and they will have less physical money that they have to move. So this plan is also helping stores uh, avoid having to move things around. Let's take a short break. Okay, how many chindal okay that's mentioned? Okay.
，话说刚刚下课期间，我看 email 发现，哎，我被通知说，呃，我获选为今年金马影展亚洲电影观察团推荐奖评审之一，还蛮酷的。Sorry, back to this. So we've been talking about uh, the difficulty that Ukrainian businesses have. In moving things around, moving physical money around, Russia has begun to target fuel supplies in the hope of debilitating the Ukrainian army. Again, I love this sentence. This is a great sentence. Most of this article we have been talking about Ukraine, and like they are in a war with Russia and they are suffering, but it's always been from the perspective of Ukraine. With this sentence, we this is the first time we get a sentence from the perspective of Russia. Now, if you're reading this piece, you're probably supporting Ukraine, and if you support Ukraine, Russia is the bad guy. And so this sentence presents the bad guy. It doesn't uh, carefully present it. It doesn't like. Introduce it and slowly present it. It hits you immediately with the bad guy. First word in the entire paragraph, Russia, and that really adds to the sense of danger and fear that the Ukrainian people have to face every day. It makes the reader feel some of that fear. It's like.、Uh, You're, it's like you're reading a story on Facebook, and then suddenly one paragraph begins with the name of your ex-girlfriend. Right? It's a big shock, or ex-boyfriend. I don't know.、Um, and so, like, this is a very powerful introduction to what Russia is doing while we've been reading all of this. So, what has it been doing? It has begun to target fuel supplies. To target means to aim at, to aim for, to try to hit. So already Ukraine needs fuel, and、uh, Russia is now attacking Ukraine's fuel、uh, in the hope of debilitating the Ukrainian army. Debilitating. The middle of this word kind of reminds you of ability, right? To debilitate. Means to take away the ability to do something. So to make them unable、uh, to fight. On February twenty seventh, a fuel depot belonging to KLO, a popular chain of petrol stations in Kiev, was hit by a Russian missile. A depot is where you store things, where you keep things. So a fuel depot is where this company、uh, keeps its fuel. What is KLO? This company, a popular chain of petrol stations. Petrol is British English. In American English, we call this a gas station. So it's a popular gas station in Kiev, and its fuel storage was destroyed by the Russians. The firm KLO has also seen imports of petrol from Lithuania via Belarus cut off by order of the Belarusian government, which is closely allied with Russia. So, usually KLO、uh, imports some of its gas from Lithuania, Litauen, and the gas travels through Belarus by Belarus. But because Belarus is allied with Russia, they're on the same side.、Uh, so Belarus has cut off KLO's gas. So like this company is like really unlucky. Russia attacks its gas stations,、uh, gas depots, and it can't get new gas because of Belarus.、Uh, so this is these are some examples of Russia targeting fuel supplies. But, and again, this but is a very, very good word to use here. Very good writing choice. But 
KLO can still import petrol from EU countries without too much trouble. So yes, it can't get gas from Lithuania, but it can get gas from the EU. And the reason I say this but is a very uh, masterful use of language is because, like, look at this paragraph. First, it begins Russia, and it's doing these bad things. It's hitting fuel depots. It's making this company's life harder. Um, and yet, not everything is bad, right? It can still get some gas from the EU. And the next two sentences are also good things. So this but introduces hope into this paragraph. In the face of the big bad enemy that's hitting all of your stuff, that's destroying your business, there's still hope. That single change in direction is very powerful. So it can still get gas from the EU. Demand is also down, and that's good because if it doesn't have enough gas, it can't sell the gas. So it's a good thing that there are fewer people who need to buy gas. Um, but the reason is not so good. The reason is because so much normal activity has stopped. So people are traveling less, moving around less, uh, so they need less gas. Firms that a month ago were fierce rivals are now sharing fuel and staff. So a month ago, competing uh, companies now are working together. Again, like the word fierce. Uh, usually the word fierce means like violent, right? Uh, but here, uh, remember like above we had the word rage. Where is it? Um, but I said that the word rage means it doesn't mean angry. It means like a fire. It's still burning. It's still going on. Can't find it, but you remember I said that. The same thing here. Fierce here does not mean violent. It means intense. There are intense rivals. so I guess. The agricultural sector is suffering too. So above we talked about service, manufacturing, like making things, selling things, but here agriculture, farms, growing things. The cost of fertilizer and pesticide have climbed, which may impinge on the next crop sowing season, which should begin by the end of this month. So fertilizer, is what you use to help plants grow. And pesticide you use to kill bugs. The cost of both of these have gone up, probably because the price of oil at the time was very high. You need oil to make fertilizer and pesticide. So the cost of these two have gone up, which may impinge on, which means may impact uh, the next crop sowing season to sow crops, S O W, to sow crops means to plant seeds, uh, to plant new things to grow. Uh, and this is a problem because they need this by the end of the month. There's a deadline. MHP, the country's biggest poultry producer, points to the interrupted supply of feed additives for its chickens and turkeys among its worries. So MHP is a company. It produces poultry. Poultry is chicken meat. So they raise chickens. Uh, and they are currently lacking feed additives. Feed is a, a food for farm animals. Uh, the food you give farm animals to eat is called feed. Additives are things that you add. So if you're raising chickens, what would you need to add to their food? Have you guys raised chickens before? No? So when you raise chickens and pigs and farm animals, 
you feed them food, but you also need to give them something else. Uh, vitamins, supplements, sometimes you would have antibiotics, uh, or other things to help the animals go grow big and fat so that they have more meat. Um, but this company says that they're having trouble uh, finding feed additives because of the interrupted supply. Supply is gongji. Uh, chickens and turkeys, huoji. Many firms are asking the government for help with spiraling costs. A spiral is a circle that doesn't close. Uh, in this case, spiraling costs means the costs are going up. But sometimes spiral can mean going down. Uh, for example, if someone says that their mental health is spiraling, it means that their their mind is stuck thinking negative thoughts and it keeps going down and they can't stop it. But in this case, it's going up. On March 8th, it, the government, banned the export of salt, sugar, meat, and wheat, xiaomai, to help bolster local stores. Bolster means to add to, to make it more. Um, stores here is not uh, a place that sells you things. A st here, store means the place where you keep things. Think of the word storage, zuzun, right? A store is where you, uh, is the place of storage. Keeping Ukrainians fed is getting harder. The state has imposed controls on the prices of essential goods. So to impose control on prices, in other words, to implement price controls means to keep to order companies to keep prices low and stable. Uh, when you see price control, it's always a low price. It's never a high price. It, the state, which means the government, has also set up bodies to scrutinize price gouging. Bodies here means organizations. So the government has set up organizations to scrutinize means examine or to check for price gouging. Price gouging means to raise prices during an emergency. Um, and once again, in American English, we spell scrutinize with a Z, not with an S. A new coordination center for food, medicine, water, and fuel keeps tabs on the supplies of those essentials. Uh, so this is a new organization. And it keeps tabs on, which means it regularly checks. It pays attention to uh, the supplies of those essentials. What essentials? Which are what are those essentials? The things mentioned in the name of the, the organization, these four. Um, and you can see that this sentence is an example of the previous sentence. The, the previous sentence says the government has set up new organizations. The next sentence gives us a new organization, but it doesn't tell us this is an example. When you see the word new and you see that it's a kind of center, then you know that this is a new organization. And then it tells you that it looks at the supplies of essential things. You can understand already that it's to examine and prevent price gouging. So you don't have to say, for example, you just have to let the reader understand that this is an example. Once again, in American English, we spell center uh, T-E-R.
The state needs to make sure it keeps itself fed too. It is marshalling funds, borrowing from the IMF, among others, and issuing war bonds. OK, to marshal. As a verb means to gather, to raise, to, to increase. Uh, in Chinese, we call this Zalbing Maima. Uh, what is it gathering? Money. Funds means money. And it's doing it in two ways. Borrowing from the IMF, among others. So borrowing from many different places, including the IMF. What is the IMF? Do you guys know? The International Monetary Fund. Uh, it's an organization created specifically to lend money to countries when they have an emergency. The other way the government is raising money is by issuing war bonds. A bond, uh, let me give you the Chinese first. 这个是暂时, uh, so bond is guo zai. How does a bond work? The government sells you a piece of paper, the and the piece of paper has uh, a date, like maybe five years. And so if you return this piece of paper to the government in five years, the government will give your money back and a little bit more. So it's an investment. It's a way that you can make money. Um, now, war bonds are just bonds. The only difference is that this government is fighting a war, but the the way that a bond works is the same. Its first post-invasion bond issued on March 1st offered a yield of 11%. So in this case, the word yield means that little bit extra money that the government will give you in five years. And it's 11%. This is usually quite high. In normal times, if you buy a regular bond, the yield will be around 1, 2, maybe 3%. This is 11%. Um, and it's higher because um, the government promises to pay you this money in five years. But will Ukraine still exist in five years? Probably yes, but we're not very sure. And that's why it, the bond is riskier. And the higher the risk, the higher the reward. So it pays you more money. And the article says this 11% is an impressively low interest rate for a country at risk of imminent conquest. Imminent means it's going to happen soon. Conquest is to conquer, to rule over, to defeat in battle. Zenfu. So it's saying that uh, if you really think Ukraine is going to lose the war, 11% is actually very low. Uh, so this sentence is actually kind of sarcastic. Uh, it's saying that basically um, many people think that Ukraine cannot win the war, but the market disagrees. That's why the price is so low. The government has posted online the numbers of its various cryptocurrency wallets from Bitcoin to Dogecoin to solicit anonymous donations. So another way the government is raising money uh, is by asking people to donate like Bitcoin, BTB, or Dogecoin, GoGoB. Um, the word solicit means ask for. So the government is asking for anonymous donations. The sale of war-themed NFTs to bolster military coffers, 
coffers is also in the works. Um, the word coffer just means a, uh, it's a it's a thing to hold money. So military coffers just means military funds, military money. Um, so what are NFTs? Uh, we, we know that the word bolster means add, right? Make increase. So they can make money by selling NFTs. But what are NFTs? Do you guys know? Yeah, basically, um, in English, this is non-fungible token. A non-fungible token is, uh, fungible means change. So it's a thing that if you buy it, the record will forever say that it belongs to you. Like in the real world, if you go buy something and you lose the receipt and then somebody steals it, you can't prove that it's yours. But if you buy an NFT, the record of the sale is not a piece of paper. It is written into a, a, a cloud based record. So like it's, it's maintained on the Internet and it's a record that nobody can change. So if in the future someone steals that thing, you can always have proof that you are the one who owns it. And so because of this added security, NFTs are usually more valuable than regular things. Usually this was written in March. The price of NFTs have gone down a lot since then. Um, but anyways, this is another way that the Ukrainian uh, government is planning to make money. It's in the works, which means that it is being planned. It's not yet available, but they're doing it. In addition to paying for the war itself, the government faces other new expenses. A payment of 6,500 hryvnias or around 215 US dollars to all workers who have lost their jobs due to the invasion, for instance. So this is uh, something that they're also the government is also spending money on. Uh, you remember in the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic around the world, governments were paying people who had lost their jobs, giving them money, make sure they don't starve to death. Uh, Ukraine is giving money to its people who have lost their jobs because of the war. And so the government has to pay for this also. It is also trying to sustain the economy by loosening restrictions. Sustain means means to keep it going, to keep it up. Buying medication no longer requires a prescription in most cases. So when you need uh, medicine, you don't need to get a doctor to write you a prescription and then go to a pharmacy. You can just go buy it directly. So the word prescription here means chu fang qian. Under martial law, customs duties have been deferred allowing food and fuel to enter the country quickly and cheaply. There should be a comma here in American English because the main sentence begins in the next line. Under martial law. What is martial law? Do you guys know? Close. Xianfa is constitution. A martial law. OK, so it's a kind of law. Martial means fighting or war. So martial law is jie yin. So under martial law, customs duties have been deferred. Customs is the business of import and export, jing chu kou. Duties are the taxes that you have to pay when you import and export. So customs duties are a kind of tax and currently they have been deferred. They have not been canceled. You still have to pay them, but you can pay them later. If they were canceled, the word is waive. Customs duties have been waived. 
spelled W-A-I-V-E-D, as you can see in the subtitles. Uh, it just means canceled, but here they still have to pay it. They just have to pay it later. But for now, that means that food and fuel can enter the country faster and cheaper, uh, along with other things, right? These are just the two main examples. The war economy will roll on. When you see this sentence, you know this is the conclusion. It says will. It's going into the future. So we're nearing the end of the article. It is now showing the reader what will happen in the future. Will roll on. Here, of course, it means that it will keep going. Um, but the choice of this word is very interesting. Usually when we say that uh, something will roll on, uh, especially when we think about war, we think about tanks, tanker, a tank rolls onto the battlefield. Um, so the war economy will roll on. The verb fits the theme of wartime. It must. The provision of services avoids humanitarian catastrophe and allows citizens to stay put and defend their country. Provision is the noun of provide. So the providing of services um, can avoid disaster and allows people to stay in the country, to stay put and defend their country and to keep fighting. In other words, this it must means the economy must go on in order for Ukraine to win the war. If the economy stops, uh, then there's no way Ukraine has enough money or resources to win. So this must is not a description. It's a call. It's an appeal. The economy must go on. As the fighting expands, keeping the lights on will become ever trickier. To keep the lights on. How do you keep the lights on? By paying your electricity bill. How can you pay your electricity bill? By keeping on going to work and making money. So to keep the lights on means to keep the economy going. Um, but as the fighting expands, it will be trickier to do this which means it will be more challenging. It will be harder. But so far, the state and business have cooperated remarkably smoothly, stitched together like the upper and sole of a boot. So the article ends with the same image that it begins. A boot. The sole is the bottom of a shoe is called a sole, S-O-L-E. So just like in the beginning, different clothing companies work together to make boots. In the same way, Ukraine's government and businesses are working together also. Like Just like they're putting together a boot. Stitch is to sew together, feng ren. But notice that it says so far. So it, it's looking toward the future and it's trying to be optimistic, but it's also trying to be realistic. Up to this point in the future, we can't tell. We can only say up to this point. It's going well so far. OK, do you have questions about this article? Uh, OK, so um, last week I said that I would divide you into groups. And I have done so. Uh, I think we can stop recording. Wait, wait, wait not yet. Before I announce the groups, um, I have divided you into groups. Before next week, 
uh, talk with your group members, choose a day to exchange your essays, prepare to give feedback. And next week we will be doing peer review in class. Um, so these are some things to pay attention to next week when you do peer review. Um, I'll guide you through the important points. So if you don't finish your essay before the deadline that you set with your group members, at the end of your essay, include your plan for how you want to finish. That way your group members know what your overall idea for the essay is and they can give you better feedback. When you read your group members essays, don't focus on the mistakes. That's my job. I'll catch the mistakes. Instead, focus on things like. Is it clear? Is it confusing? Does it make sense? Should there be more detail? Should there be more information? Should there be more opinions and feelings? Um, and th use the that that's how you can think about uh, how you can give feedback. Next week when you come to class. I want you to follow a specific order, so like don't just talk everybody at the same time for each group. Choose one essay to talk about. The first person will talk about it. The second person will give feedback. The third person will give feedback and then the author can decide whether they want to respond. Uh, the author can choose not to reply. That's fine. After the first essay, then go to the next essay. The first person gives feedback. The second person gives feedback. The third person gives feedback and the author can choose whether to reply. So please follow an order. The point is to not start a conversation. Once you start chatting, you're not going to stop. Trust me, I know. So in order to make sure you can finish discussing on time, first go through one by one. And after you finished, then if you want to, you can keep talking about some specific points or some specific ideas. Uh, and you know, once people start chatting, some people might start arguing and we really don't want to have an argument. So please follow this order. Now, when you're giving feedback, try not to say things like, is this true? Are you sure? Is this right? First of all, that means you don't trust the author uh, and it gets very awkward. Uh, but also, that's not the point of why we write or why we read. Information is not the point. We want to practice communicating. So instead of asking, is this right? You can think about, is this clear? Is this good communication? What is the author trying to do with this essay? What is this essay trying to tell us? Uh, and is it successful? Now, when you're the author and you're listening to feedback, it can sometimes feel a little uncomfortable, right? You spent so many hours writing this essay and people are giving you feedback. They don't understand what you're saying. They're all idiots. They have no idea what I'm trying to do. But please remember that your group members are giving you feedback based only on your essay. If in the future you become a writer and you write for an audience or readership like in a newspaper or online, you will not have the chance to go around and explain what you mean after the reader has finished reading. The only way you can communicate with your readers is with your essay. So if you're Group members did not understand your essay. If they got the wrong idea from your essay, you need to fix it. That should be part of your essay. Now, at the same time, different readers 
will have different ideas. Sometimes those ideas will contradict each other and you can't do all of the things. So at the end of the day, the author is the person who decides what to do. The reader can tell you this part has some problem, but it is the author who decides how do I fix the problem? Does that make sense? OK. And that's the only thing we're going to do next week. So if you finish early, you can keep talking. You can begin revising immediately. You can leave early and please the following week hand in uh, your paper copy essay. So next week peer review. The next week after that, give me uh, your essay. Questions? OK, um, so now I will uh, show you your groups. I know that some people are not here today, um, but you can keep in mind who they are and uh, communicate with them 